Interim Children's Network Officer. I'm Kathy Turnbull, and uh, I passed the audition, and this year I am the Children's Network Officer. So, <laughs> last year I was a nervous wreck up here, and, and this year I still am. So, that transition to <laughs> didn't help me much at all, but I am so glad to see everyone here this morning. Um, last year I asked how many people had been, it was the 28th, right, last year, and I asked if anyone had been to all 28, and uh, Randy Schultz, who was the, the Director for Children and Family Services, had been to all 28 conferences. And I'm just wondering, I know my secretary, Tammy Williams, has been to 13, but has anybody here been to any more than 13 of the, how, any more than 15? Any more than 20? 20? More than 20? Between 15 and 20? Oh, okay, okay. So next year we are going to be our 30th and we're going to do kind of a commemorative thing and try and um, remember all of the folks that we've had as our keynote speakers. And so we'll probably have to get with some of the historians, folks that have been around for a while and been to some of the conferences so that we can get all of the names and people and stuff in, right, in place. So in just a couple of minutes I'm going to invite um, Sheriff McMahon up to say a few words, and then Supervisor Rutherford will be introducing our keynote speaker. Um, but first though, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge some of our distinguished guests and our generous sponsors. Um, Fifth District Supervisor uh, Janice Rutherford. <laughs> Second District Supervisor Janice Rutherford. <laughs> I was looking at the Fifth District table here, I'm sorry. Fifth District Supervisor Jessie Gonzalez didn't make it. She was going to. She's got a meeting at 9 o'clock that she chairs. She was going to be here between 7.30 and 8.30 just to give me a rah-rah, pump it up speech, but she didn't make it, but that's okay. We've got Laura Mancha from her office and, and Daniel Flores. I haven't seen Mr. Ted Alejandro yet, but Superintendent for San Bernardino County Schools will be here or is here somewhere. I'm not sure if he's here yet. Um, San Bernardino Citified Unified School District board member Margaret Hill is supposed to be here. She may not have arrived yet as well. Most of these folks have n a number of events and things that they have to do in the course of a morning or a day. So they come in and we acknowledge them when they're here and we do the best that we can to make sure that we recognize them. Um, as my boss, she's not quite here yet either. Assistant Executive Officer for Human Services, Linda Haugen, is not quite here yet. She'll be here. Um, I know the Honorable Christopher Marshall will be here. He's not here yet, but he had to, somebody subbed out, and so he had to take a courtroom this morning. The Executive Director for First Five San Bernardino, Karen Scott, is here. I have not seen Marlene Hagen. She's the Director for Children and Family Services. We expect her shortly. Um, Trudy Ramondo from the, uh, is the Director of Department of Public Health, and we expect her shortly as well. Assistant to the Director for the Department of Behavioral Health, Veronica Kelly, is here. <laughs> the outgoing President and CEO for Children's Fund, Aaron Phillips, is here. The incoming interim president and CEO for Children's Fund, Stacy Iverson, is also here. <laughs> president and CEO of Young Visionaries, Terrence Stone. I've seen him with his selfie stick somewhere. From the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, we have Lynn Osorio and Mindy Silva. I know they're here, I saw them. Deputy Chief Probation Officer Holly Benton is here. <laughs> Health Officer for San Bernardino County Public Health, Dr. O. Hikwari, may be here somewhere. Medical Director for Behavioral Health, Dr. Teresa Frosto, she may be here as well somewhere. And the Regional Director for the Child Care Resource Center, James Moses, we're expecting him this morning as well. And I'd also like to take a minute to, for a special thank you for our generous funders and sponsors without whom this event would not be possible. First Five San Bernardino. The county, San Bernardino County Children and Family Services, they've been a sponsor from the beginning of time from the, for this conference as well. San Bernardino County Department of Behavioral Health as well, a big sponsor. 
The first, for the first time, uh, San Manuel Band of Mission Indians is, is a, has been, was a big sponsor this year. Who, by the way, donated their additional registration spots to provide scholarship opportunities for some of the youth in attendance. The Coalition Against Sexual Exploitation gave us a big chunk of money this year as well. Kaiser Permanente. I think they've got staff here this year. Is Kaiser in the house? Kaiser Group? They were, there they are. Mental Health Systems Incorporated, Molina Healthcare, who graciously donated their registrations so that six youth could attend, Crittenton Services for Children and Families, Loma Linda University Health System, Department of Pediatrics, Inland Empire Health Plan, Children's Fund, who through their generous sponsorship has made it possible for 20 youth from San Bernardino High School to attend this conference this year. Foster Youth Services provided scholarships for four California Youth Connection young adults to attend this year. And I am very happy about that as well. San Bernardino County Preschool Services sent so many of their staff. I'm very happy about that. And last but certainly not least, the Children's Network staff, especially our event coordinator, Christy Lufek, and the exhibit hall coordinator, Denise McKinney, Honestly, it's, it's, it's like a little marketplace in the exhibit hall this year. I walked in there and they've got the little tables with little flowers and plants and the Casa Village um, on one section, all of the people who are donating a portion of what, they've, um, what they make uh, during these two days to Casa of San Bernardino. So welcome to all of our exhibitors as well. I think we're piped in uh, there this year so they can hear us. Um, I, I took off for the first three weeks in September, and somebody yesterday told me, wow, that was a pretty bold move with your, uh, with your event coming up. And I said, but these guys have been doing it for so long, they've got it down pat. And I mean, it is just, it's, it's in order. It is a well-oiled machine by now. And I am so grateful for all their hard work and that they didn't call me not one time in three weeks. So that, thank you to the Children's Network staff for sure. Um, and this year you're going to notice we're going to do a couple of things different, like for instance this morning um, after our keynote speaker we're going to take a little quick five minute break, don't go too far away because it's kind of hard to corral six, seven hundred people again, so um, five minutes maybe stretch your legs, get some water, some um, juice. And then we're going to have a, a panel here. And then from 11 to 12 o'clock, instead of doing um, a breakout session this morning, from 11 until noon, there'll be book signing it back in the exhibit hall. And that'll give you an opportunity to see some of the exhibitors and also to get your uh, books purchased and get them signed. Um, and also this year, uh, we have youth uh, and young, young adults. I was corrected by saying young adults for the first time because I know a lot of you are young adults. But young, really young adults and youth here for the very first time. And it is my uh, hope that the youth will enjoy this so much and that they will get so much out of this event and um, maybe come back next year and do workshops. I'd like to have a, a whole youth track run by youth um, attended by adults and youth because what better way for us to find out what they need than to ask them or to hear from them. And when you get a couple of them together, you hear a lot of stuff that you wouldn't hear ordinarily and some things you don't want to hear, but for the most part, it's beneficial and it can help you in your day-to-day -day work. And I found that as a line social worker, asking them kids what they wanted and what they needed was the best way to find out how to help them. So I'm hoping that this is gonna be a, like a launching point having them here today for next year's conference to just um, enhance that. Um, let's see, I think that's it. Oh, now I would like, please join me in welcoming Sheriff John McMahon. That's appropriate, right? Yeah, I'm good with that, or the theme song, The Cops, or something like that. Well, welcome to all of you. They tell me that this is bigger than last year. Last year was about 500. They're expecting 700 people here today. That is incredible. And that goes right in line and reinforces what I've been saying for, for the last couple of years is this county is incredibly successful because everybody's working together. 
We have partnerships in this county that I haven't seen in my 30-year career over the last couple of years develop, whether it be working with behavioral health on the CIT program that we train all of our deputies to do, our JIP program where we teach youngsters what the consequences of bad behavior will be, but we also teach the parents how to be parents. And along with that, we work with Clean Sweep at all the schools, partnered with county schools. Terrence Stone is here today. We use his Young Visionaries program. There's Terrence in the back. Um, great things that we're accomplishing because we're working together. Last year, I spoke about our homeless outreach program. And I'm here to tell you it is going well. And it continues to get uh, discussion generated throughout the entire country. We were in Washington, D.C. with our folks not only there but in our state and locally as well and the reason that that program is so successful is because of the partnerships that we have built we work with behavioral health we work with the veterans affairs we work with the housing authority everybody working together accomplishes great things and that's what i see in this room today everybody coming together to learn work together and truly make a difference our side is primarily enforcement but we certainly need the help of everybody in this room because we have a lot of jail beds in this county but we don't have enough money to continue to build jail beds and to continue to staff them once we build facilities what can we do to reduce recidivism of those that have been incarcerated and then what can we do to reach out to the youngsters to keep them from coming into the system in the very beginning and I think there's some great ideas in this room. There's some great folks that we've worked with that truly do make a difference. And that's our goal, is to keep those folks that don't need to be in jail out on the street and have them be productive members of society, living in houses, reunited with their families, with careers, paying taxes, which for some of us in this room, the more taxes that are paid, the more money we have for our budgets to do better work. So it's in our best interest to do that as well. But it's good for everybody. Whether it be our homeless population or our criminal population, what can we do to make their lives better, which ultimately raises the quality of life for our county? I've said this a couple of times to business folks. When somebody comes to our county to re relocate, whether it be a business or a residence, if they get off the freeway and they see a homeless guy that's trying to accost them while they're waiting for the signal, if they see graffiti, broke down cars, just everything in disrepair, they might just get back on the freeway and continue to the next town. It's our responsibility to do the best we can to raise the quality of life so that when those folks get off the freeway, this is a great place. And I think collectively working all together, we can certainly make a difference. I talked about enforcement for just a minute, and let me touch on that. We're all familiar with Prop 47 and the changes in the law based on the voter initiative in November reducing some prior felony crimes to misdemeanors. Now, whether we agree or disagree with all of that really doesn't matter because that's the law of the land at this point. But as a result, street-level narcotics are now misdemeanors. We have retooled our organization and taken the guys that were working the street-level narcotics and converted that whole division into gang enforcement. That's where the work needs to be done. Because if we can attack the gangs and try to take them apart, we know we'll find the guns, we know we'll find the drugs, and that's where the true work needs to be done. We've made great progress over the last four months in doing that, taken a lot of guns off the street, incarcerated a lot of folks for serious felony crimes that are victimizing folks in our county. That's where the work needs to be done, but we can't do it alone, and folks like you in this room are a key part to our success and overall success of our entire county. Thank you all. I hope you have a great couple of days here. You know, I, I think I, I think I missed. I think I missed one earlier. I think I I, I didn't I, when I was um, interim. Um, network officer, I, I looked towards some folks 
uh, particularly as mentors, right, to watch how they handled themselves in public and how they handled themselves at the podium. And one particular person that I admired so much was Diana Alexander, honestly, <laughs> from preschool services. And, uh, and, and she had her big event in, in August, and, and I was at the front row with her before she came up to the stage, and she's like, I don't even know what I'm going to say or do. And then the music came on, and she lit into song and dance. Like, you, like she was like, I, that was, that was, she was so comfortable on the stage doing that. And I'm like, well, as my mentor, I mean, I can take a lot of other things from her, but I'm not going to get up there and, and shake it like she did, that's for sure. Because if you've ever seen the movie The Jerk, right, that, that rhythm, that's, that's, what I, that's what I have. So I apologize because I do absolutely admire her. Okay. Second District Supervisor Janice Rutherford has led efforts to balance the county's budget and restore public confidence in county government since being elected to the San Bernardino County Board of Supervisors in November 2010. Voters elected her to a second four-year term in June 2014, and she has served as chair of the Board of Supervisors from January 2013 to January 2015. As a Girl Scout growing up in Upland, Janice learned the value of community service, and as a high school student in Ontario, she learned the importance of being an involved citizen. She went on to volunteer with Boys and Girls Club of Fontana. She joined the Rotary. She served on the Chafee College Foundation Board, and she's an active member in her church. Janice earned her BA from the University of Riverside and holds a master's degree in American politics from Claremont Graduate University. But most importantly, Janice is married to Steve Lim, and they have two young boys, Ethan and Noah, which means she spends a good deal of her free time with Legos. Please join me in welcoming Janice Rutherford. Where's Diana? She's actually going to do it. She's going to dance. I had no idea what the theme song was going to be. I was actually a little nervous there. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your service to our community and for being here this morning to network with each other, to learn and be motivated about what we can all do to further enhance the quality of life in San Bernardino County. We are so very fortunate this morning to be joined by Father Greg Boyle, and it is my extreme honor to be able to introduce him to you and tell you a little bit about his background before we have the opportunity to uh, learn from him and be inspired by him. Father Boyle was born in Los Angeles, one of eight children. The family owned a farm, and he and most of his siblings worked on the farm with their father. Mom was kept busy just keeping track of eight kids, I guess. He graduated from Loyola High School in Los Angeles in 1972 and uh, went on to immediately join the Order of the Jesuits, was ordained a priest in 1984, holds several degrees in English and theology. His work took him to Bolivia, to Mexico, and to Folsom Prison. And his work with those who live on the margins transformed him and gave him the inspiration to transform the lives of others. He returned to Los Angeles, the neighborhood of Boyle Heights, where he became the pastor of the Dolores Mission Church, the poorest parish in the city. He began serving in that capacity in 1986. And in 1992, which most of you will remember as a period of some civil unrest in Los Angeles, he started Homeboy Bakery, the idea to provide the opportunity for members of rival gangs to work together, to find out what they had in common. Homeboy Bakery launched a movement that is now Homeboy Industries that includes seven different social enterprises to give former gang members skills, to give them the opportunity to work together. And Homeboy, Homeboy provides a variety of services, everything from AA to NA to parenting classes to anger management to tattoo removal. I think 36,000 tattoo removals last year transforming lives inside and out. I had the opportunity to tour Homeboy uh, about a year ago, I think. 
And while I was talking with Father Boyle and seeing how the lives were being changed there, I knew we needed something like that here in San Bernardino County. And probably a lot more than one of them because we've got the largest county in the country, right? Unfortunately, that means we have, as Sheriff McMahon alluded to, one of the largest jail systems in the United States. Are we seventh largest, Sheriff? Seventh largest jail system in the country. That's too big. That's too many people incarcerated, and our jails are not equipped to be able to transform their lives. Now, I firmly believe there are some people in this world who are evil and who just need to be locked up. They're not interested in change or transformation. But there are so many who are, and we don't do enough to help them with that transformation. So I sat with Father Boyle, and I said, what do we do to bring Homeboy to San Bernardino County? And I heard about the programs, and I heard about the social uh, enterprises. But then I looked at him, and I said, how do we clone you? And this most humble man in the universe said, you don't need to clone me. You need to create a sense of community, a sense of kinship, so that your people can transform themselves. I hope today that you will all catch a spark of his vision, his wisdom, his humility, his deep desire to serve, and the ideas that he has generated from so many years of watching over these transformations and loving people through these transformations, and that in his words, some of you in this room will feel inspired to become the Father Boyles of San Bernardino County so that we can transform more lives here. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor. Would you please join me in welcoming Father Gregory Boyle. Thank, thank you for not giving me music. Uh, I, I knew I would be mortified no matter what it was. Um, anyway, it's a privilege to be with all of you uh, this morning. Uh, thank you for gathering. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over something. It's a privilege of my life to be accompanied here this morning uh, by Steve Avalos and uh, our, our newest uh, recruit here, uh, Julio, who will be, uh, both of them will be joining me up here on our panel discussion, so get your questions ready. For 30 years I've worked with gang members and uh, it's, uh, my life has been changed and transformed because of them. The day won't ever come when I am more noble or uh, have more courage or am closer to God than Steve and Julio. And the thousands and thousands of men and women who've walked uh, through our doors, uh, people like Luis Perez who's uh, uh, kind of helps run the place a handful of, of folks who run Homeboy Industries, um, gang member, shot caller, been to prison. Uh, perhaps he would have been one of those guys that you'd say there, there's no way that he will change. Heroin addict, the list is long. Now he runs the place uh, with a great integrity and power and authority. But he's also become something of a public speaker in his own right, and he likes speaking. And so we had dinner not long ago, and he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly. <laughs> he said, you know, you got to pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. <laughs> I said, yeah, no shit. Uh, <clears throat> I'll keep that in mind. Uh, there's a vision that brings you uh, to these two days. And you know, it's a vision of, in the end, wanting the world to look differently than it currently looks. And good for you. The prophet Habakkuk writes, the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, wait for it. But none of us want to wait for too long, you know, con los brazos cruzados, you know, tapping our feet, staring at our watches. You want to make something happen. And so that's what you're about in these next two days. You want to make something happen. And what I want to suggest uh, in the highest aerial view is in the end that what you want to do in this county is really create a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. 
Now, Mother Teresa, I think, diagnosed the world's ills correctly by suggesting that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. How do we together stand against that idea? How do we imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle? So part of our task, a communal task, uh, is to dismantle the barriers that exclude. And part of what all of you do for a living is that you have found your way in your own particularity out to the margins. And here's the truth about the margins. If you stand at the margins, look under your feet the margins are getting erased precisely because you chose to stand there. And you stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. You stand with those whose dignity has been denied. And you stand with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. Every once in a while, you get quite privileged to be able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out, with the demonized, so that the demonizing will stop and with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. <clears throat> so I suspect that if kinship happened to be our goal, we would no longer be promoting peace and justice, we'd be celebrating peace and justice. Because no kinship, no peace, no kinship, no justice, no matter how singularly focused you may well be on those really worthy goals, they're byproducts of a goal. And the goal is kinship. If you have kinship, peace and justice find their way. So for 30 years, uh, such a privilege to have been taught and educated and brought to transformation because of people like Steve and Julio. Uh, but in the last uh, several years, and, and I'm so happy about this, that the homies have taught me how to text, so I couldn't be more grateful uh, because I find it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm pretty good at it. I'm pretty dexterous, you know, LOL and OMG and BTW. And the homies have taught me a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, hell no. <clears throat> and I've been using that one quite a bit lately. I know I can't be alone in being uh, completely vexed by autocorrect. I really hate, hate autocorrect. Um, I remember once, not that long ago, a homegirl named Bertha, she texted me, she goes, where are you at? And I texted her, I'm about to speak to a room full of monjas, you know, sisters, nuns. I'm about to speak to a room full of monjas, and I pushed send. And autocorrect told her that I was about to speak to a room full of ninjas, <laughs> which she thought was pretty darn interesting. <clears throat> My favorite one was a homie who wanted some help paying his rent, and and I just didn't have the money, so I, I, I texted, things are tight, and I pushed send, and autocorrect uh, told him, thongs are tight. <laughs> and uh, he wrote back, sorry to hear that. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, what, what about my rant? You know, so. Anyway, though, there I am in a, in a car with two homies, Manuel and Poncho, and uh, they're older vatos who've been to prison and tattooed gang members. They do a variety of things at Homeboy Inn. Manuel's in the front seat, bon Poncho's in the back. They're about to help me give a talk at a high school. And uh, so we're on the road just briefly when all of a sudden Manuel gets an incoming text and uh, he reads it to himself and he chuckles. And I say, what is it? And he goes, oh, it's dumb. It's it's from Snoopy back at the office. Well, Snoopy, I'd just seen him. He gave me a big abrazote as the day was beginning. And Snoopy and Manuel worked together in the clock-in room, you know, and it's actually a hard job because you've got hundreds and hundreds of, of workers, and occasionally gang members can be attitudinal. So um, it's a tougher job than you would think. And I said, well, so what's he say? He goes, oh, it's dumb. Hang on. Hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. 
Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. You have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <clears throat> well, we died laughing and, uh, and then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other. Now they shoot text messages. And there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How do we obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate? That there is a difference? That there is an us and a them? How do we bridge that distance so that there is no daylight that separates us? Even in service, everybody does service. Even in high schools, it's part of the curriculum now. Um, and service is a good thing, obviously. But service is where you start. It can't be where you end. Service is the hallway that gets you to the ballroom. You want to get to the ballroom, which is the place of connection and mutual, exquisite mutuality. Uh, the place of kinship. That you want to get to the ballroom. At, at Homeboy Industries, I'm not the service provider and he's the service recipient, you know. We, we, we look at it that way and that's a trap and, and we want to catch ourselves. Um, at Homeboy Industries, I'm not the great healer, and that gang member over there is in need of my exquisite healing. No, we're all in need of healing. We're all a cry for help. It's one of the things that joins us together as members of the human family. There was a homie uh, everybody called Dreamer, and I knew him since he was a mocosito growing up in the housing projects, and got into trouble, big family, um, got into a gang, super smart kid, very intelligent, but he never really did the school thing. Had a very dangerous sense of humor that I always enjoyed. And, but in his 20s, early 20s, he was kind of a yo-yo in and out of being locked up. He's doing great now. But during that early, uh, early 20s period, he was, uh, nobody found more job opportunities through Homeboy Industries than this guy. But he would always kind of be working and then he'd gravitate back to vague criminality, you know, usually something involving drugs, the sale of or the use of, and then he'd wander back, um, you know, uh, to, to me. And so this one time he had finished a four month uh, stretch in county jail, a probation violation, and there he's sitting in front of me uh, in my office. And, uh, <coughs> And uh, he says what homies often say, this time it'll be different. And I go, mm, all right. So uh, with him sitting there, I picked up the phone and I called a friend of mine who runs a vending machine company in Alhambra. He had hired homies in the past, hoping maybe he'll do it again. And sure enough, he says, yeah, tell him to show up tomorrow. That's a holy man right there. And so Dreamer began work at the vending machine company and Two weeks later, there he is again in front of my desk. I go, Híjole Madre Santa, here we go all over again. But this time he pulls out of his pocket his very first paycheck. And he uh, waves it proudly. And he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. I mean, my mom, she's proud of me. And my kids, they're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, well, gosh, you know, who? <laughs> and he looked at me strangely and he said, well, God, of course. Oh, sure, no, no, that's right. That, that would be God, yeah. He said, you thought I was gonna say you. I said, no, gosh, God's number one. He said, you are so lucky we're not living in them Genesis days. I'm sorry, them Genesis days? And he goes, yeah, because God would have been had struck down your ass already by now. <laughs> well, I guess he uh, told me, but we just fell out of our chairs and laughing, 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 and I have no idea who's the service provider, who's the service recipient, I don't know. One of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend and 
a great man in all the ways we've come to know that and um, one of the best listeners I've ever known. If you were talking to Cesar Chavez, nobody else existed but you. But once famously a reporter had commented to him and said, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar just shrugged and smiled and said, the feeling's mutual. And that's where we want to arrive, that place of mutual transformation where there is no daylight that separates us. So as was mentioned in the kind introduction, Homeboy Industries was born uh, a lot of years ago in 1988 uh, when I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of LA, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village. At the time, anyway, it was the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. We had eight gangs at war with each other, which is not typical anywhere in the country, really. Um, making it, according to the LAPD, the place of the highest concentration of gang activity anywhere was my parish. I didn't know this when I drove up. I buried my first young person killed because of this sadness in 1988. And one month ago, I buried my 200th young person killed because of this sadness, a young man named Roger. So we did a lot of things in those early days. We started a school, the first thing we did, because there were um, so many middle school, junior high age gang members who had been given the boot from their home school. Nobody wanted them. Uh, so they were wreaking havoc in the projects. They were violent. They were selling drugs. They were writing on the wall. So I walked out to them and I would kind of isolate each one and they'd say, hey, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, every single one said, yeah. And then I couldn't find a school that would take them. You know, that's kind of forced my hand a little bit. So um, right across the street from the church is our elementary school, our parochial school. And um, first two floors are school. But the entire third floor was the convent, you know, where the ninjas lived. <laughs> and uh, so I gathered all the nuns together and I said, hey, you know, would you guys mind, you know, moving out? And uh, we could turn the convent into a, uh, a school for gang members. And they said, sure. So that's what happened. And gang members came in la uh, large numbers. It was a tough school, fights all the time, because there were enemies, you know. But they showed up because the teachers loved them. And then they said, if only we had jobs. So myself and the women in the parish, we marched around the factories that surrounded uh, the housing projects, trying to find felony-friendly employers, you know, and that wasn't so forthcoming. So. Um, <laughs> So um, we invented things, you know, we had a, um, a crew that built a child care center on the property and we had uh, graffiti removal crews and light landscaping and maintenance crews. And, and by 92, when we had the unrest in the city, uh, our community, which everybody fully expected would explode, didn't. And LA Times and others started to ask why and I said, I think it's because we got 60 strategically hired gang members and there was suddenly a kind of an investment in, in, in their community and it didn't explode. So a movie producer um, heard this, summoned me, and he said, what do you want me to do with my money? And I said, well, buy this abandoned bakery across the street from the church. It has ovens. I don't, we'll put hair nets on rival enemy gang members. They can bake bread. We'll call it Homeboy Bakery. And that was the entire extent of my business plan. And he said, sure. So we were off and running. And a month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market. Once we had plural, we come up with the highfalutin Homeboy Industries name, as if there was any industry involved in this, you know. And, and not everything worked. I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. Homeboy Plumbing really was not hugely successful. <laughs> Who knew uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes? I did not see that coming. And nobody ever intends to do such a thing, but we kind of backed our way, honest to God, backed our way into becoming now the largest gang intervention rehab and reentry program on the planet Earth. No place bigger anywhere. <clears throat> 
Uh, so we have about 15,000 folks a year who walk through our doors. We have, according to the Sheriff's Department, 120,000 gang members in L.A. County, which is impossibly too large a number, but that's the working number. 1,100 gangs. And uh, our program is not for those who need help. It's only for those who want it, just like recovery. You, you know, it takes what it takes, and you walk in the door. We don't recruit. We People know, after nearly 30 years, people know where we are, and they show up or they don't. But once they do, it's kind of red carpet and ticker tape parade and lots of curricular things from anger management to GED. We still have a school, NAAA, uh, parenting, you name it, we have it. Uh, the centerpiece is our 18-month program, uh, training program, of which uh, Julio was a, a part of that, and Steve is a navigator who kind of helps the different crews. Uh, and then we have case managers, um, huge mental health department, and as much as we have five paid therapists, but 47 volunteer therapists. Free tattoo removal, again, no place on the planet Earth removes more tattoos than we do, a designated clinic with three laser machines, one paid physician assistant, 43 volunteer doctors, um, lots of thousands of laser treatments a year. So if any of you are uh, starting to regret that first five tattoo you have, uh, <laughs> see me afterwards. And it was all started because of a guy named Frank, who I didn't know, in uh, released from Corcoran State Prison. Two days out of prison, he wanders in, sits in front of me, and tattooed on his forehead like a damn billboard, filling the entire space, and pardon my French, it said, fuck the world. And he said, you know, I am having a hard time finding a job. <laughs> I said, uh, well, you know, Frank, maybe we could put our heads together on this one, you know. And I'm thinking, where, you know, where do you send this guy to McDonald's? Do you want fries with that? No, I don't want fries. Mothers clutching their kids, running out of McDonald's. So I, I hired him, naturally, and um, he bagged bread for two years for us. And then I went in search of a doctor with a laser machine. I found one at White Memorial Hospital who donated one hour a month. When I think back on that, I go, yikes. Very generous, but it was, you know, to chip away at Frank's forehead and a few others. And before too long, I had a waiting list of 3,000 gang members who wanted that very same service. So we couldn't obviously stay with that arrangement. And now Frank is a uh, security guard at a movie studio, and there is no trace whatsoever of the dumbest, angriest, stupidest thing he'd ever done. Proving that everybody in this room and outside of it is a whole lot more than the worst things they've ever done. <clears throat> and then, uh, you know, we have all our, uh, we actually have 10 social enterprises at this point, a whole bunch of restaurants and um, eateries here and there, the city hall, diner. Um, we have a restaurant at uh, LAX uh, Terminal 4, a grab and go at Terminal 6, farmer's markets, Homeboy Grocery, which is where we sell chips and salsas and all the Ralphs in half of the state. Um, Homeboy Bakery is thriving. Uh, we just had a report yesterday, there were 49% uh, increase in a month, which is amazing in production. And, uh, and Homeboy Silkscreen, Homeboy Homegirl Merchandise, where we sell our logo stuff, uh, solar panel installation training program, which is really a successful program. Um, I know I'm missing a whole bunch, lunch truck, um, in Homegirl Cafe, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude, will gladly take your order. <laughs> and they cater. Um, it's become sort of a who's who. I mean, a lot of people, it's, uh, you can go there at any time and you're going to run into an elected or some big power broker or movie stars. Uh, Jim Carrey uh, has been there several times. Uh, uh, a couple months ago, with only two hours notice, we got a visit, uh, two hours notice from the Secret Service. We had a, a visit from uh, Vice President Joe Biden, who uh, wanted to have lunch there. So motorcade and, uh, you know, entourage, and he was selfies galore, you know. And 
Um, I wasn't there. I was actually making my eight-day annual silent retreat, so um, I, I got the debrief when I came back. So I see Louis, Louis Mora, and he says, hey, while you were gone, we were visited by an MVP. I said, do you mean like a VIP? Go, that one, VIP. <laughs> he goes, damn, gee, imagine here at Homeboy Industries, we were visited by the Vice President of the United States, Mick Romney, he said. <laughs> I swear to you, I could not have made that up. Uh, not the Romney, my favorite part is the Mick, Mick Romney. So we, we may add a, a current affairs class to our curriculum. <laughs> but anyway, uh, famously, uh, Diane Keaton showed up once uh, for lunch. She came with a regular uh, actress, movie star, Oscar winner. And uh, her waitress is Glenda. Glenda's a big girl, been there, done that, uh, tattooed, felon, parolee. She has no clue at all who Diane Keaton is. And so she's taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, what do you recommend? And Glenda rattles off the three platillos that she particularly likes. And Diane Keaton says, I'll have that second one. That one sounds good. And, <clears throat> and it's at that moment, for some reason, something dawns on Glenda. She goes, wait a minute. I feel like I know you from somewhere. You know, like maybe we've met. <laughs> and Diane Keaton decides to sort of deflect it humbly. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I suppose I have one of those faces that people think they've seen before. And, and then Glenda goes, no, now I know. We were locked up together. <laughs> <coughs> Honest to God, that just took my breath away when I heard it. And, and I don't believe we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings now that I think of it. But suddenly, kinship so quickly, Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress, exactly what God had in mind, and if you'll permit me. Jesus says to the gathered that you may be one. That's the whole deal. That's the goal. That's God's dream come true. Kinship. Standing against forgetting that we belong to each other. All of us are called to be what Alice Miller, the late great child psychologist, called enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love, return people to themselves. And you get returned to yourself in the process. That's the way it works. At Homeboy Industries, we don't believe in holding the bar up and asking people to measure up. You just hold the mirror up and tell people the truth knowing that your truth is my truth, and my truth is a gang member's truth, and it's all the same truth, and here's the truth. You are exactly what God had in mind when God made you. And then you watch folks on the margins as they suddenly become that truth. They inhabit that truth. And no bullet can pierce it. No four prison walls can keep it out. And death can't touch it because it's huge. But part of the task of everyone in this room, I suspect, is you have to occasionally reach in and you have to dismantle the messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way, that keep people from seeing their truth. Because it's absolutely true that the principal suffering of the poor throughout history is shame and disgrace. I invite you to sometime to take a leisurely stroll through the Acts of the Apostles. Not because it's a, some quaint snapshot of life in the earliest Christian community, but in fact it's the measure of health in any community at all. Things will leap off the page. Things like, see how they love one another. It doesn't get better. There's nobody needy in this community. Wow. A better metric you couldn't find. But my favorite one is an odd one, and it says simply this, and awe came upon everyone. And it would seem that the measure of health in your community, in anybody's community, may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry, rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. Uh, some years ago, I was invited to speak to 600 social workers in Richmond, Virginia, 
And as is often the case, I say, oh, sure, sure, yeah, no, that sounds great. And then I don't really read what it is I'm being invited to do. So and then I presume, you know, keynote, maybe open it like today or close it or lunch or something. So I finally look at what is this thing? And, I, I, and, it, and it's a one day thing, nine to five. It's social workers. It's a gang in service. I am to be the only speaker at this thing. And so I quickly invited in the two homies uh, working there at the time. Uh, Andre and Jose and I sit them down I said you're flying with me to Richmond Virginia I want you to get up and tell your stories take your time because we got a long ass day to fill so I'd never heard their stories and Jose gets up in a um, very self-effacing manner and um, 25 years old or so at, at that point in his life and uh, he had, was a trainee, just like Julio and, and just like Steve before him, and, and began <coughs> in the humble place, which we call the, the humble place, the first phase, which is the everybody has to clean urinals, which is a good equalizer if you're a shot caller gang member. Nope, everybody does the same thing. Everybody starts there. And then he worked his way up and did a variety of things. He ended up being a very valued member of our substance abuse team, uh, a man solid, solid in his own recovery. Gang member tattooed parolee, but uh, also had a long stretch of time uh, as a homeless man, an even longer stretch as a heroin addict. So he got up and began in this very kind of low key way. He said, I, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers gasped. And then he said, it sounds way worse in Spanish. You know, <laughs> we got whiplash going from gasp to laugh. He said, I think I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California and she walks me up to an orphanage and she knocks on the door. And the guy comes to the door and she says, I found this kid. And she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me. My grandmother came and rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and a lot of things you couldn't. Every day, my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school every day. First t-shirt, because the blood would seep through, and second t-shirt, you could still see the blood. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? And then he gets overwhelmed with emotion and he can barely continue. And he seems to be staring at a piece of his story that only he can see. And when he can speak, he says through his tears, I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. And now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them, but also in our willingness to do one more thing. If you cannot welcome your own wound, you will tend to despise the wounded, and you can't let that happen. 
Nobody in this room has ever met a healthy treatment plan that was born of a bad diagnosis that's never happened, ever. Nobody has ever met a hopeful kid who joined a gang that has never happened in the history of kids or in the history of gangs. Not once has that ever happened. Once I was on the Dr. Phil show, I know, what, what was I thinking? But <laughs> well, we thought we had talked the producers down from doing something dumb, and so there I am backstage, and I can hear Dr. Phil. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the founder and executive director of Homeboy Industries, Father Greg Boyle. So I walk out there, and to my horror, the audience is clapping up in these big bleachers. There he is in the middle of the stage sitting on his stool. My empty stool awaits me. On his side of the stage is this gorgeous, beautiful mahogany coffin on those four-wheeled gurney deals, you know. Uh, and on my side of the stage is a perfectly reconstructed jail cell with bed, toilet, sink, bars. They went to great expense for these two set pieces. You already know where this is going. So they fly out little guys, 14, 15, 16, African-American, Latino, and a Caucasian kid, with their very distraught single mothers. They fly, take them in one at a time. And with each kid, Phil sort of grabs them by the lapel figuratively. And, and don't you see where this choice is leading to you? And these are kids who are gravitating perilously close to gang involvement. Don't you see where this choice is leading you? Death or prison. Well, one kid after another, by, by the third kid, I had to kind of intervene. I said, Phil, how do I break this to you? These kids do not need more information. They do not need data. They know this better than you and I do. They know that this will lead to death or to prison. They do not care that it will. That's the key diagnostic moment. No kid is seeking anything when he joins a gang, ever. Always fleeing something. And if they tell you they were drawn, lured, attracted, wow, wine, women, and song, join a gang and see the world, if they tell you that, they're, they're strangers to themselves. And that's part of what we do at Homeboy. We want you to do the work. We're not interested in people who are here for the check, only for the change. Gangs are the places kids go when they've encountered their life as a misery, and who doesn't know by now that misery loves company? There are only three profiles of kids who join gangs, not five, not eight, three. The first profile is a kid who is so despondent, so stuck in a dark place, that he cannot conjure up an image of what tomorrow is, and consequently his present is so, is not compelling for him. And so he cannot, he doesn't care whether he inflicts harm. He doesn't care whether he ducks to get out of harm's way. It is the despondent kid. The second kid is the so damaged and traumatized kid that he cannot see his way clear to transform his pain, so he keeps transmitting it. And the third kid in profile is the mentally ill kid. And it's a kind of a combo burger of one and three and two and one and and they're on a continuum of severity. Some kids more mentally challenged uh, and, and mentally unhealthy. And, and others are more despondent than traumatized. But that's the way it works. If we believed that, as I do with my entire soul and life, I bet my entire life that that's true, what would we do? We would, we would infuse hope to kids for whom hope is foreign. We would help heal the damaged and the traumatized, and we'd deliver mental health services in a timely and culturally appropriate way. Would that pretty much handle it? Yeah. To say nothing of uh, the great disparity between the haves and the have-nots and poverty and racism and a whole slew of other social things, those are the only profiles of kids who join a gang. You've never met a bad, evil kid who joined a gang. That's never happened either. That's never happened. And I've been doing this too long. So I don't put up with it anymore, you know. Any kid who you think is evil or, or bad, 
that's a kid who's more damaged than the others. Or that's a kid who's more mentally ill than the others. And mental illness is real. And like the guy who shot up the theater in Colorado and his mother, heartbreaking, she said, uh, my son never chose schizophrenia. It chose him. And we're not going to make any progress in this country until we can acknowledge that mental illness is real. But we're simple. We would like to strike the high moral distance. That's not me. Don't those people know the difference between right and wrong? And that's why we don't. We can't have compassion for somebody who shot up a, a, a theater because it's so egregious. Shame on us. I've never had to carry what that guy has had to carry, ever. And because I had a nephew who was schizophrenic and hung himself in my sister's basement, the sweetest, nicest kid, and he hung himself because he didn't want to shoot up a theater in Colorado, basically. And he didn't choose schizophrenia. It chose him. Shame on us. Because that requires a compassion that's superhuman. And that's where we need to be. And we won't make progress until we get there. That's an editorial comment. Let me end here. <clears throat> people always ask about that, and we're going to have a chance to have a question and answer after our break. But people always ask, I'll anticipate a question about enemies working side by side with each other. It's difficult at first, but a homie will come in, I'm ready, ready, ready. I go, okay, I have an opening in the bakery, but you have to work with X, Y, and Z, and I rattle off the names of rivals, enemies. And they always think for a long time, and then they go, okay, I'll work with them, I'm not going to talk to them. And this used to always bother me in the early days until you discover, of course, that it's impossible for human beings to demonize people they know. You can't, humans can't pull it off. So I had a homie, a little chaparito, 19 years old. Everybody called him Youngster. So Youngster, I thought, was ready. I bring him to Homeboy Silkscreen Factory. Our huge, been around 21 years, 2,500 customers, high quality, reasonably priced. We UPS to San Bernardino County. <laughs> so I'm introducing him to his 30 coworkers and a lot of enemies, a lot of rivals in this batch. And I, and I watch him, he shakes hands, look him in the arm, firm handshake, and I go, wow, this is great. Until he gets to this last guy, everybody calls Puppet. <coughs> and Puppet seems to be wanting to avoid this encounter altogether. And, and when they're in each other's vicinity, they mumble something, they stare at their shoes, they don't shake hands. Well, I know they're enemies because I know what gangs they're from, but he just shook hands with a whole bunch of enemies. <clears throat> I discover later that this was a hatred uh, that was really quite personal and beyond which neither of them thought they could really get past. So I sensed that much at the moment. And so I said, look, if you guys can't hang working together, let me know. I got a bunch of people who want this job. Calladitos, they don't say a word. Well, six months later, Puppet leaves his home and goes to a corner store some distance from his house, and uh, he purchases something. On the way home, for some reason, he decides to take a, a shortcut, so he dodges into an alley, and because he took this detour, suddenly, unexpectedly, he's surrounded by ten members of a rival gang, ten against one, and they beat him badly. And while he's lying on the ground, these guys just won't stop kicking his head until he's lifeless. Somebody finds his body and takes him to White Memorial Hospital where he's declared effectively brain dead. But it's the policy there to keep you connected to machines for 48 hours so you can have two full days of a flat read with no brain activity and then the doctors can sign the death certificate, make it official. This allowed family and friends to gather. I, I was at St. Louis University giving a talk. I flew home immediately. I've seen a lot of horrible things in my life, but nothing to compare to the sight of this young man with his head swollen many times its size. Horrifying. You could barely train your eyes on him. So at the end of the 48-hour period, I, as a priest, I gave him a blessing 
I anointed his forehead with oil. We disconnected. A week later, I buried him. But in the first 24 hours, while Puppet was lying beaten in the hospital, I was alone in my office. It's 8.30 at night. The phone rings. It's Youngster, Puppet's co-worker from the silkscreen factory. Hey, he says, it's, that's messed up about what happened to Puppet. I said, yeah, it is. And then with a certain kind of eagerness even, he says, is there anything I can do? Can I give him my blood? And we both fall silent under the weight of it. Until finally he breaks the silence, choking back his tears. And he says with great deliberation, he was not my enemy. He was my friend. We work together. Now, can I say that always happens at Homeboy Industries? Well, of course it does. Any exceptions? No, I can't think of a single time. And it shouldn't surprise us that God's own dream come true for us, that we be one just happens to be our own deepest longing for ourselves. For it turns out, it's mutual. And so you stand at the margins, and you look under your feet, and you notice that the margins are getting erased because you chose to stand there, and you brace yourself because people will accuse you of wasting your time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. And this is your job description, to make those voices heard. For the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint. And if it delays, We wait for it. Thank you all very much.